Hello everyone, this is Dr. Ravinder Sial and welcome again to Spartan Tutorials. So one of the first steps in order to study any protein of interest is to purify it from all the other contaminating th thousands of proteins present in the cytoplasm. So one of the chief methods of purifying a protein is chromatography and today we are going to talk about one of the types of chromatography which is extensively used in academia as well as industry and that is ion exchange chromatography. So let's get started. Now any chromatography begins with the tissue homogenate which is basically grinding of tissue, disruption of tissue, disruption of cellular structure whether it could be a liver tissue or heart tissue or brain tissue or bacterial cells or fungal cells, breaking up of cells and then purifying it and separating out the broken cells as well as organelles and getting a pure fraction of just the proteins which are soluble proteins of the cytoplasm and this is accomplished by a series of centrifugation steps or series of purification steps and what we end up with is a supernatant here for example which contains the soluble proteins this still contains thousands of different proteins how do we purify our own protein of interest from these thousands of contaminating proteins that's where chromatography comes in now the basic principle of chromatography is pretty simple the name chromatography comes from the earlier studies on isolation of different pigments so chroma means uh, color and graph means to write so this was based on the early studies back in the days of industrial revolution when people used to separate out different pigments needed for textile industry in britain and other parts of the world especially in Europe but later on as many techniques were added and it was extensively applied to biochemistry as well as chemistry people realized that this is basically a separation procedure and nowadays chromatography basically refers to any type of separation procedure where we can separate any molecule of interest from all the other molecules present in the mixture the two components present in any type of chromatography are mobile phase and a stationary phase. So mobile phase refers to the fact that we have a column here for example and mobile phase refers to the protein mixture as well as the solvent and the buffer that we use to drive the mixture of protein through the column and the uh, material present in the column which pretty much stays in place and tries to and that is the main uh, factor which separates the proteins that is the stationary phase usually these are beads or some sort of packing material that we use as the stationary phase uh, silica agarose cellulose these are commonly used stationary phases and solvents like acetone organic solvents water uh, buffers different types of buffers they are normally used as the mobile phases so the separation occurs between the interaction of the mobile phase with the stationary phase now ion exchange chromatography is of two types one is called anion exchange chromatography and other is called cation exchange chromatography but these can be a little bit confusing now anions as you know they are negatively charged ions and anion exchange chromatography basically involves a positive matrix which likes to bind anions so negatively charged proteins in, a, in this case okay so anion exchange although anion means negative but it is, does not refer to the actual material it refers to the binding ability the material or the stationary phase likes to bind to anions and conversely for the cation exchange chromatography cations are usually positively charged but here the 
uh, stationary phase or the beads they are negatively charged and they like to bind to positively charged proteins so cations they like to bind to cations now as depicted here for the cation exchange chromatography we have the polymer beads with negatively charged functional groups and they like to bind positively charged proteins now proteins with different positive and negative charges present in the protein mixture they will bind to these polymer beads and due to their interaction of opposite charges being attractive to each other they will separate so the for example in this case the negatively charged proteins they will quickly flow through the column but positively charged proteins will get stuck and the more positively charged a protein is the more stuck or more re residence time in technical terms it will have in the column now i want to emphasize that the field of chromatography has progressed a lot so the diagram that you saw before it is kind of the student level project that we usually do based on for example isolation of chlorophyll pigments or something very simple but nowadays we have very sophisticated protein chromatography equipments available from different companies GE, Biorad, Sigma Aldrich all these companies they offer tremendous amount of very high quality chromatography reagents and products so for example you can have these very nice exchange columns uh, and ion exchange resins that we use and different systems for example we have a complete system like this NGC Quest system along with fraction collectors from Biorad and similar equipments are available from other companies which basically automate a lot of stuff and help you with a lot with the protein purification so I just want to mention that this is a very sophisticated piece of equipment these cost uh, you know thousands of dollars so lakhs of rupees so very very sophisticated equipments and but the basic science behind them is fairly simple to understand now the idea of ion exchange chromatography comes from the net charge of a protein now any protein for example in this case we have a protein called concan concanavalin A this is just a representative protein this is true for any other protein also it will have a mixture of positively charged amino acids as well as negatively charged amino acids on its surface as well as on the inside and what will happen is that a protein will have a net charge based on how many negative and positively charged amino acids are there negatively charged amino acids for example aspartate and glutamate and positively charged amino acids like lysine arginine and histidine contribute to the overall charge of the protein now what will happen is that a protein in a particular pH environment has either a positive charge or a negative charge or it has no charge the point where it has no charge it has a specific term which is called Ti or isoelectric point below the isoelectric point if we decrease the pH it will have a net positive charge and above the PI if we increase the pH it will have a net negative charge now you can understand why this is important for our separation because if we decrease the pH the protein will have a net positive charge and what it will bind to it will bind to a cation exchange column that's why an understanding of the pi of the protein that you are interested in as well as the ph that you should be working with is very very important while working with ion exchange chromatography and the same case applies to ph above the pi negatively charged protein overall it will bind to an ion exchange column now let's come to the actual materials present in the ion exchange chromatography and these are called ion exchange resins ion exchange resins are made up of a matrix which is a hydrophilic pretty strong beaded it is form of it is in the form of very very small microscopic beads and along with them charge groups have been attached so these charge groups can be negatively charged in case of cation exchange chromatography or positively charged in case of anion exchange chromatography so the matrix can be made of cellulose agarose polymethacrylate polystyrene polyacrylamide and these have different characteristics regarding 
how much flow of solvent they can accommodate so that is how much pressure they can accommodate and what is the bead size and what kind of separation do they achieve so they have different physical properties and groups can be for an ion exchange these are quaternary ammonium also referred to as Q in the literature and diethyl aminoethyl and that is DEAE these are anion exchange groups and sulfopropyl also referred to just as S and carboxymethyl also referred to as M these are cation exchange uh, groups so these groups are attached to the matrix and together matrix plus charged groups constitute the ion exchange resin now this is a scanning electron micrograph of a resin and you can see that these are very very tiny beads actually which are present in the column so billions of these beads are present in the column now let's discuss what happens when we try to separate out different proteins using ion exchange columns so the first step is column equilibration where we try to stabilize the pH of the uh, solvent plus uh, stationary phase so in case of cation exchange chromatography we have negatively charged groups shown in blue here and these like to bind to positively charged proteins the cation thing and in the case of anion exchange chromatography we have positively charged groups and they like to bind to negatively charged proteins so we have our protein mixture and different proteins will try to bind to different uh, types of resins based on what kind of resin that we are using the next step is sample adsorption and that is binding of different proteins to the column so for example proteins with lot of negative charges they will bind to very strongly to the anion exchange column and proteins with very strong positive charge they will try to bind to the uh, cation exchange column so this this is basically binding of the proteins to the column rest of the proteins they will simply flow through and the final step is sample desorption which is also referred to as elution because what we want to do now is we want to get back our isolated protein so hopefully our protein has attached to the matrix and now we want to elute it usually the method of elution is to add a lot of competing salt so for example if it is an anion exchange resin so it likes to bind to negatively charged ions what we use is chloride ions an excess of chloride ions from NaCl or KCl to drive the elution of our protein from that column okay and this also regenerates the column so that it is ready for further use a simple column can be reused multiple times the elution is usually carried out in two uh, basic forms one is called the isocratic elution or the step elution where after equilibration and wash and washing steps we elute by abruptly changing the uh, buffer concentration and then use wash steps to elute our protein whereas in gradient elution or this is called linear gradient there is an increasing amount of buffer concentration slowly and slowly and this leads to separation of the proteins usually gradient elution, elution is carried out first in the trial phase and then isocratic elution is carried out in the final stage or the preparative stage when we really know that okay on a large scale we can do this now different types of ion exchange buffers are available for ion exchange as well as cation exchange for example for cation exchange buffer we have buffers like MES phosphate and HEPIs which are active over different pH ranges there are lots of other ones usually the companies like BioRad and Sigma Aldrich and GE Healthcare they have a list of different uh, cation exchange buffers and anion exchange buffers and they have very good competent help desks that, that they will help you to optimize what kind of resins and what kind of buffers you need to be using similarly for anion exchange we have buffers like piperazine triethanolamine tris very commonly used buffer and ethanolamine and you can see that they are active over a range of different pH values. Now there are a couple of factors which affect the protein resolution and the protein separation. 
One is the particle size. Now I told you that the matrix is made up of cellulose, dextrose, agarose, different types of materials. But the particle size can be very small, for example, in this case 10 micron or a very large particle size can be there, for example, 80 microns. Now what happens is, due to small particle size, it will lead to higher resolution because small particle size usually does not tolerate a lot of pressure of the solvent. So there is a lot of residence time in the solvent. Uh, for the protein so it stays longer in the solvent as well as in the column and it usually leads to better resolution and better separation of the proteins whereas a larger particle size column usually leads to a slightly less uh, sharp resolution and separation of different proteins for example here you can see that there is some kind of merging going on between different peaks of the proteins but here we have pretty nice demarcated peaks for different proteins. Similarly, flow rate, the amount of solvent that is passing through the column per unit time also has a very important effect on protein separation. Very low flow rates, for example, this is 229 centimeters per hour, which is really, really slow. This usually leads to better resolution and better separation of the proteins. And higher flow rates usually lead to kind of crude resolution, crude separation. So these are usually used for preparative work where we are okay with slightly less resolution and this is used for analytical work where we are really want to make sure that our protein is absolutely 100% pure. Okay, so that finishes our discussion of ion exchange chromatography. Uh, we have a nice figure here showing the separation of three different proteins on an ion exchange column using the uh, gra linear gradient elution technique here just to uh, give you a recap of the technique. So I hope you liked the description of ion exchange chromatography. If you have any doubts or questions, please let me know in the comments below. Till the next time we meet, take care and bye-bye.